therapeutic landscapes, how, how could, when people use certain places as healing places, um, ethnomedical geography, spatial perspectives, you know, how far do you have to travel to get to a particular place to get health, and, and so on. So political ecology is a really interesting phenomenon that came out of uh, social sciences, and it's a way to ask critical questions about human environment relationships that have to do with political economic forces and have to do with um, long-standing culturally um, significant ecological relationships. Um, so, you know, cultural ecology comes out of anthropology, how do people adapt to their landscapes, to their environments, um, to their natural systems. Of course, political economy is all about how do political institutions and economic systems uh, influence each other? And then just imagine marrying those two ways of thinking about the world together to look at particular uh, phenomenon, localized phenomena in terms of the broader economic and social context. Um, and very much important in that is to look at the historical relationship between uh, you know, humans and a particular environmental issue. And, um, and also very much important is adaptation. How do people adapt to pressures and forces in the environment? It's very you know, ecologically grounded. And, but with this political piece, you really can uh, tease out hidden agendas and um, study social forces and social political power struggles. So it's a pretty cool field. And my advisor kind of applied it to studying health and disease. That you can, you can look at, ask certain questions, like what is the political ecology of health, or uh, if you have a particular patient population and they're achieving a positive health outcome with a particular natural element, well, um, what kind of um, struggles do they have to go through to achieve that health outcome, to find that therapeutic uh, agent? Or if people are experiencing psychological distress or uh, worry or troubles related to boundaries that are drawn between humans and the environment, how do people cope with that, adapt to that? as that form of distress is a form of dis-ease, dis-ease, political ecology of dis-ease. So anyway, you can, you can do this uh, basically across a whole range of uh, issues, a lot of health outcomes if you, if you do this, and the key thing is locality. So like, here's some examples of what people had published in political ecology of disease. Let's look at how deforestation impacts health of people in this particular country in Africa. Let's look at how the, the uh, dam building in Ghana, uh, when they needed the electricity to um, smelt the aluminum, uh, how did that impact uh, the creation of a stagnant water pool that led to the proliferation of a certain species of snail that led to a certain parasite that lives in the snails that got into the bodies of the children that played there, and then you know they got this uh, disease that uh, causes uh, liver enlargement. You know, so you can imagine, it's, you can think of a whole string of things. Well, what, what caused that liver problem? Like, well, was it because of the, the desire to build, get more electricity because of the way the International Monetary Fund asked the country to, you know, et cetera. So this is the kind of examples of things that people have done. Very local, and you get a whole global perspective out of that. And those are some other examples. Petrochemical industry in the Texas Gulf Coast, people have written about, you know, they call that the cancer alley over there, so. So I've written a little bit about this uh, in this paper, Political, Psychoactive Substances in the Political Ecology of Mental Distress in the Harm Reduction Journal. I'll refer you to that. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I use this frame to understand psychoactive substances. And then through that, we'll talk about cannabis. So psychoactive substances is really, I mean, some people talk about substances, substance abuse and substance treatment. It's a shorthand for psychoactive substances. What is a psychoactive substance? It's consumable, it's usually self-administered, and it can have um, impacts on your mood, emotions, feelings, sensations, perceptions, and thinking. And across cultures, throughout history, taking that long historical view, humans have known about organisms in their natural environment that when taken in whole or in part could stimulate, sedate, palliate, elate. It's a nice uh, rhyme I found in one paper. Um, so in the modern era, uh, an arbitrary subgrouping of these organisms. So you notice I'm not talking about them as substances, they're or organisms, they're, you know, um, be they plants or fungi, along with the chemicals they produce and related cogeners, which are like similar chemicals, have become the locus of intense medical, public health, and international law enforcement focus. So th this, is, this is the way, just to notice I mentioned the words arbitrary subgrouping. 
because there are many substances that are psychoactive in the environment. And there, there's some in this Pepsi can, and the cola, and the decoffeinated coca leaves, and the caffeine. But uh, is it an intense focus of mental, medical, public health, and international law enforcement? Um, okay, this is a very wordy slide, but there was a one psychopharmacologist named de Grandpre who, who came up with this term called pharmacologicalism. It's very, it's very wordy and clunky, but this is the term to understand how a certain, like you, you know about racism and classism and sexism. So there is a kind of an ism when it comes to uh, drugs that makes us believe that you can categorize a drug as a good drug or a bad drug, one's in for all. Um, and that's an essentialism of drugs, angels and demons, as he writes. And in doing so, it obscures all the sociocultural, the political, the economic structures that shape both drug understandings and drug effects. That's what de Grand Prix wrote. Um, he gave the example of cocaine and Ritalin. So cocaine is, uh, you know, white powder or, you know, demonic powder or whatever, people have this very negative association with cocaine. In fact, it is a schedule two, but you could use it in medical practice. Um, but, you know, it has this negative connotation. Ritalin, or methylphenidate, is used by children across the United States and uh, for the treatment of attention deficit disorders. Did you know that Ritalin and cocaine, you can't tell them apart on brain scans if you give them to subjects? Subjects, if you blind them, they don't know which one they're taking if you give it to them the same form. They are chemically, pharmacologically, uh, neuroimaging-wise identical. But one is demonic and one is an angel. And this is the, that context, that whole thing is about pharmacologicalism, that how we kind of put all this other stuff on the drugs. And so in this system, we say that drugs have moral attributes that can stem from, uh, not from the social and psychological, but the chemical itself is, you know, the problem. So that's the, uh, that you can basically morally categorize as a scientific question. That's like kind of what the scheduling thing is about. Okay, these are the immoral bad ones and these are increase, decreasing immorality or whatever. So that's um, really, I think, a, um, uh, I think one of the concepts that I have tried to um, advance to help understand like what, what's going on with our social uh, relationship to, to drugs, to drug control, to psychoactive substances. And, you know, of course, drug obscures, it's a very obscured term. Uh, in that falls herbs, which, you know, um, one of my friends in the audience says, well, hey, drugs, uh, drugs don't make seeds, herbs make seeds. So there's this confusion. But I also read somewhere that drug is from an old German word that was something to do with drying herbs. So there's all this historical conflation, but the most important thing for us to do is to understand that drug effects are social, uh, socially, economically, culturally. Th these are way more important, and you can't just once and for all write what, what drug is good or bad. So if you think about this class of substances, you can group them into biotic substances and abiotic substances. Biotic substances naturally occurring, integral part of the biosphere and the web of life, just like you are, just like the trees here are. And then, um, you know, these particular biotic psychoactive substances have evolved with biochemical profiles that impact our own endogenous neurotransmitter systems, muscle relaxation, pleasure, etc. Uh, abiotic substances are unmodified, slightly modified versions of these. And there's other novel products of the synthetic age. I put together this list, this picture of 10 psychoactive biotic substances, contraband biota, that I think are of the most social and um, legal um, locus of intense focus in the current global situation. These are, uh, this is the first three, coca, uh, opium, coca, and cannabis. Uh, then we have uh, cot, which is uh, Horn of Africa, Somalia. Um, this, these two seeds produce um, components that make ayahuasca, which is a, a, a DMT-containing tea that is drank in South America. These are peyote seeds, salvia seeds, uh, iboga seeds, and these are uh, psilocybin fungi um, spores. But you know, uh, sprouting spores. But this is basically a way to think about 
These, these are seeds. These are, I intentionally tried to show you them as seeds. And you can see when you start with a seed, you can create, a path, you know, the seed is basically, you know, uh, goes through its stages of development. All in the audience are like probably familiar with these development stages with cannabis, so I won't go into that. But, you know, and then this is a guy in New Jersey who uh, smoked cannabis at the New Jersey State Legislature wearing a... Uh, kind of a prison guard, a prison um, prisoner uniform to kind of, you know, basically publicly display the criminalization. Uh, Ed Fortune is his name. And, uh, you know, this is cannabis and this is the, the resin and this, this is how you can extract keef. I don't know, I, I, I think this audience is well familiar with this. So um, the next slide is um, coca seeds. <clears throat> you can see that coca, uh, these leaves, coca leaves, orthoxylum coca, 0.1% by weight is coca cocaine, and it takes 2,000 pounds of, of cocaine, coca leaves to make uh, five pounds of powder cocaine. So it's this large extractive process. Here's the uh, prime minister, president of Bolivia, holding coca leaves up at the United Nations, making this symbolic, I'm having a close contact with this plant, it's close to me, and you know, your laws are, don't apply to us, and they actually changed their constitution to recognize the the validity of coca for their for their society. And then you take cocaine and add baking soda and you can make crack. And then this is opium poppies, poppy seeds, these lovely poppy flowers. Uh, and then you can, um, you know, this is a field in Afghanistan and you can score the poppies and you get this milk, milky latex, 10% by weight, uh, morphine and codeine. Uh, you dry it into a gum and a ball and then here's the extractive process. Uh, first was extracted in 1805, and then you can add uh, anhydrous vinegar, dry, dry vinegar, and that's you make the dye acetyl morphine or heroin, different degrees of purity. But you know th these these are massive extractive processes to make the final powders. But you can see it all comes back to the seeds, and there's a whole range of you know social and cultural uh, ties and histories to these substances. Psilocybin fungi, um, uh, peyote cactuses. So what I'm interested in is the the close contact of humans with these banned psychoactive biota. You know, two two terrestrially evolved species coming into close contact, and what do you experience locally is the rule of global and international prohibition laws that encircle the biota, kind of a invisible circle like a bubble. Um, and those boundaries are shaped by socio-political forces, power, influence, authority, and they cause an alienation of individuals freely associating with these elements of the natural world through a threat of social exclusion for the individual who comes into close contact. That's the, that's the sort of the issue. It's a, it's a carceral ecology by separating people out into, into, into a, you know, a threat of incarceration or other punitive uh, so uh, punitive uh, punishment. So you can see that the, the other point I make is that this contact between humans and these psychoactive biota are made, uh, are, are mediated through typical ecological issues, mutual adaptation, coevolution, and then, you know, which influences how much people want to come into close contact and deep contact. And the latter being understood by the logics of pharmacology, physiology, metabolism. Today, many who use psychoactive substances, these banned ones, are pursued by criminal justice systems and methods that increasingly undermine human dignity. And we'll talk about that with cannabis later on. But uh, you still, the federal penalty for any possession of any amount of cannabis is still one year in prison and up to five years for growing one marijuana plant. Uh, and the death penalty is routinely used abroad and available to prosecutors in some cases in the US. Um, and, um, multi-decade mandatory prison sentences routinely meted out to drug offenders. And um, the legal problems, the distress that people feel related to these uh, tactics are actually themselves pathologized. That is to say, if you have psychoactive substance close contact related legal problems, it's a mental problem rather than a governmental problem. You know, that's kind of the, uh, the interesting way in which the medical psychiatric uh, diagnostic schema, which I'm going to show you here. This, this is a, the book that psychiatrists use to classify uh, mental health problems. 
the diagnostic, it's called a DSM. This is the type number four, the fifth one just came out. They've revised some of this, but you can see that um, they say for cannabis right here, legal problems. So if you have legal problems uh, that can occur as a consequence of arrests for cannabis possession, that is a criteria on which you can say that you have a diagnosable mental health disorder of cannabis abuse mental disorder. And they say that for every one of these other substances too. And then they clarify that you know, substance-related disorders are distinguished from non-pathological substance use, for example, social drinking, and from the use of medications for appropriate purposes. So it's, it's, a very, it's another kind of codification of pharmacologicalism. And I wanted you to see how the way that the legal problems, um, the distress, is kind of pathologized in this way. So now we're going to talk about cannabis uh, and some of the work that I did. As I said, I divided it up into three uh, uh, medical cannabis systems as terms of access, delivery, and distress. Access would be access to medical marijuana amnesty, you know, asylum from prohibition laws, uh, medical information, treatment monitoring. Uh, that's how these laws work. A physician authorizes, and then, then you go to another site to, to have access to the maturated seeds, um, you know, and, uh, which are environmental plant genetic resources. And then the third aspect is coping with the distress and structural violence inherent in this schizophrenic system. So let's take a historical tour of human cannabis relations. Um, cannabinoid signaling, which is the basis of, of human cannabis relations, evolved 600 million years ago in living systems. Hydra, sea squirts. Cannabis, 36, 35, somewhere in that 37 million years ago, it's actually very late in terms of the evolution of, of plants. Uh, so kind of more of an advanced flowering plant. Um, evolved 37 million years ago. Hominids, um, four million years ago. Homo sapiens, about 100,000 years ago. The first law criminalizing cannabis was actually 100, um, 103 years ago, something like that, and that was in uh, Massachusetts. But you can see, um, once we came to the scene, then we went back and criminalized something that was you know, 37 million years before us. It's interesting. Uh, okay, and then let's think about 1937, which was the year that the federal government banned marijuana. Um, 1936, uh, the German Nobel Prize, uh, Austrian German American pharmacologist won a Nobel Prize for discovering the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. In 1938, uh, a psychiatrist discovered electroconvulsive therapy. And in 1937, so there's all these advances, in 1937 we were saying that marijuana turns you into a bat, uh, the official medical scientific expertise of the, of the country. So just putting into context some of, I'm gonna show you that now. Um, I've written some about this in my law review article. So the, the congressional record of the 37 Marijuana Tax Act is full of homicidal mania, racial slurs, fears of miscegenation, mixing of races, and which was a way to enhance the threat level of marijuana in society. That was what the discourse was. If we, if we um, don't do something about marijuana, we will have more of these problems along the lines of homicide and, and mixing of races. The, one of the guys that stuck his heels in was this Dr. Woodward, who had a medical degree and a law degree from the American Medical Association. He said, hey, we don't do this because uh, you really should let the doctors and pharmacists and let us handle this because we're gonna lose a, a lot of useful medicines, not only that we have now, but in the future. And they argued that uh, it wasn't dangerous and had been there already for a century and these kind of things. But, in fact, their testimony was falsified on the, on con there was a, there was a um, what's that word, um, when you, basically the, the fraud was committed by the Congress when they, another congressman asked what the AMA's testimony was, and that congressman, his name was Vincent, said, oh, the AMA is in favor of the bill. And that congressman went on to become a Supreme Court justice. So, uh, uh, his name was uh, Frank Vincent, you can look that up. But anyway, this <coughs> Dr. Woodward um, said that, uh, look, there's, um, there are, he was reading a report from a pharmacist saying that he still admits that there are exceptions in which cannabis cannot apparently be successfully substituted for because the doctors were being questioned, if we get rid of cannabis for medicine, you have other medicines that can take its place, right? That's, that's what they were saying. And the, the doctor said, well, okay, yeah, maybe for a few things, but there's one thing that we really can't, 
replace. And they, they said, well, what was that? He said, well, the work of this Pascal, not, not the famous mathematician, but a different Pascal, seems to show that Indian hemp has a remarkable properties in revealing the subconscious. Uh, hence, it can be used for psychological, psychoanalytic, and psychotherapeutic research. And, um, and, then, and then the congressman says, well, can you use something else for that? And he said, I don't know of anything else. You know, uh, That, by the way, was recognized by John Stuart Mill in his work on psychology. And he said that cannabis has a way to revive old memories. And psychoanalysis depends on revivification of old memories. So this is a fascinating little historical thing in the congressional record. That was what the AMA's position was in 37, that if we lose cannabis, we will destroy the potential for psychotherapy to, to bring back old memories. This is an article from JAMA in 1938 in which they reviewed the thesis of that French Pascal guy. And you can see here, um, they mentioned, this was in 34, that they talked about the use of the leads the author to conclude that the drug has a value in revealing the content of the subconscious mind. So, you know, this, this was a known principle in, in medicine discussed in journals. But the federal government brought in this guy from Temple University, James Munch. He was a PhD pharmacology professor, and he said that basically his research showed that in dogs, showed that if you gave cannabis to the dogs, they would do, their minds, would, personalities would disintegrate after three months. And, and he later testified as the same expert witness in marijuana homicide trials in New York saying that he had used marijuana and had transformed into a bat and flown around the world and landed head down in a vat of ink staying there for nearly 200 years. This is, was on record in a capital murder case where somebody said that being in the, in the presence of marijuana gave them negative homicidal vibes. And, and he's like, yeah, I can believe that because you know I had this experience. So this, this, is, the, this is literally, Actually, after that happened, the, the federal government said, you really don't want you using our name anymore and when you testify on your marijuana expertise. Uh, so, but it's, this, is, this is the guy that the evidence was based on that banned marijuana in 37. You know, at the same time, acetylcholine was being discovered as a neurotransmitter. We were kind of in this, in this kind of stuff. So this is a, some more discussion between uh, Dr. Munch about the dogs and everything. And, and he says something like, you know, hey, uh, I'm not a dog psychologist, so I can't really tell you much more because the, the congressman is asking me, does this apply to humans too? It's, it's, it's quite funny and, and sad. But what happened in 1966, um, Timothy Leary, um, he wrote, in, when he was in jail in Folsom State Prison, he wrote this treatise and said, really, the, the main turning point happened in the 60s under the Johnson administration when... Um, Basically, the question was, 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 was drug control going to be in the hands of the police and the Department of Justice, or is it going to be in the hands of the Department of Health, Education, Welfare, Surgeon General, kind of people with white coats or people with guns, as my colleague Dominic Corva, has, who spoke at the first, uh, first speaker in the speaker series, he's, he's coined it like that. So that's really the moment in which the government decided we're going to be shifting out of the health context. We're going to hand it over. We're not going to... We're not even going to pretend to have these health shills. You know, we'll just turn it over to the um, to the med uh, uh, the legal authorities. And he said that uh, you know another war on heresy had been declared, and uh, and he said history may well decide this is the second belligerent disaster of the Johnson administration. The first one being uh, continuing the war in Vietnam. Okay. So interestingly enough, there was a doctor. Uh, despite, so what happened was from 1930 to 1970, that marijuana tax act was still on the books, but you could still do some limited medical research with, with marijuana, even though they were phasing it out. And uh, there was one doctor named uh, Henry Hermann who actually used marijuana in his psychotherapy practice. Uh, he was the only psychiatrist licensed to, to do this. And he said my main interest was the use of it as a psychotherapeutic uh, agent. He was a uh, duly appointed researcher under class five of the Marijuana Tax Act. This whole schema was thrown out in 1970 when Leary actually um, appealed his case and, and the, the whole schema was thrown out. But, um, so I just wanted to show this to you before we get to the schedule one days, what was happening that this, this doctor was able to say that, you know, marijuana is excellent in helping facilitate psychotherapy. And, um, 
that, hey, it might be contraindicated for individuals who have borderline schizophrenics and underlying, underlying other tendencies, but he, he really was, uh, it was really interesting to know that there was a doctor who was able to use marijuana in a, such an open fashion with his psychiatry patients and was able to write about it. We can't really do that very well even today. So one, when um, they were trying to rewrite the laws, this, um, they asked the Sec Secretary of Health and Human Services, well, well, where should marijuana go? Well, we got this new scheduling thing we're gonna put together you know, based on the UN schema. And uh, well, should it be, he, Egberg said, well, we think we should, we should just keep it in Schedule 1 for now. Well, we're doing some research right now, and once that research is done, we'll kind of move it out depending on that. Um, that was a, a foolish move because, again, there was really no, no mechanism in place to apply the research results to the scheduling because it was left in the hands of the political executive branch. Um, this physician, by the way, was the personal physician to General Douglas MacArthur. And um, so the congressional report said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to put marijuana in the schedule depending on what this commission, Nixon's commission, says. And then the commission came out in 1972 saying that cannabis should not be equated with heroin. we got to take it out of that schedule. They were talking about the international schedules, where in, in the international schedule, Schedule 4 is like our Schedule 1. So they basically said, get cannabis out of that controlled category. And uh, unfortunately, it was never done, and it's still there. Um, so you know, basically, what happened? Nixon never wanted this commit scientific commission to really do anything. He said, "This is the kind of things that he said that it's associated with Jews, psychiatrists, war protesters, and communists." Um, what you know? What's the funny? Every one of those bastards that are out there for legalizing marijuana, are Jewish. What the crisis is the matter with them? This is the leader of the free world. You know, the, the the person whose office is determining scientific policy about drugs. You know, and he basically told the commissioner head, "You better not come out soft on marijuana." He was talking to a fellow Republican, this guy named Schaefer, from, who was former governor of Pennsylvania, and he said, "Make sure you kind of." confuse the difference between marijuana and other drugs, other dangerous drugs. I've you can find the audio of this. You can hear this. It's all in the Nixon tapes. I have one clip here of a different, just to give you an example of how. Let's see if it comes out. Hold on. Let me... Uh, This is, this is Nixon kind of politically scheming on how to put drug control in for veterans, whether we talk about youth or veterans, let's score some more points and let's figure out a way to get uh, drugs out of the hands of the National Institute of Mental Health, like the researchers who focus on you know, mental health. Let's get it out of them. Let, let them do whatever the heck they want to do, put people on the couch. That's his disparaging way of talking about you know, psychotherapy and treatment. You know, this is, examples of how much sort of hatred there was for, for you know, a medical scientific approach. So, um, so as I told you, cannabis was used in medicine for, in the U.S. for, you know, a hundred years in the, in the U.S. pharmacopoeia. Uh, it was started by this Dr. O'Shaughnessy who rediscovered cannabis' uses when he was in, in India and uh, discovered, used it to treat tetanus, rabies, seizures, convulsions. He was quite a brilliant guy. I don't have time to go into more about his story, but there was 2,000 different medical preparations in the U.S. with cannabis in them all over the uh, pharmacies. 
famous doctors in the U.S., uh, William Osler, in medical history, William Osler, a, uh, a Dr. Gower, uh, a, a Dr. Brown Sickard, a Dr. Reynolds, a lot of famous names in the history of medicine, you know, extolled the virtues of cannabis for various medical uh, formalities like pain, migraines, etc. Because um, I'm in New York, I, I made this list of the cannabis um, pharmaceutical houses in New York State, a lot of in New York City, where you could purchase cannabis products, you know, for, for years, you know, somewhere 262 Fifth Avenue, and, you know, 476 Broadway was the Ganjawala company. Uh, I actually have walked by there, there's like a, ba a bank there now. But, you know, just, just to give you an idea of just how widespread cannabis was in the, in the uh, just the city of New York or the state of New York. Uh, so this is a little bit of history. I won't go into much about how cannabis, actually drug strains of cannabis, made it into the U.S. Some people also think that drug strains of cannabis might have evolved from the hemp strains that spontaneously had a genetic change and shifted to THC production. But uh, we won't talk more about that. Um, you know there's 21 states now in the District of Columbia that have legalized medical use, two states that have legalized recreational use. Um, Actually, I'm going to skip this. So what I want to talk a little bit about now is, is some of the pharmacology and science that, you know, is that cannabinoid medical science and looking at that also from a historical perspective because I've taken you through some of the legal history, but what, if, you, if you go to the National Library of Medicine and type cannabis or cannabinoids and say, I want to know how many papers are being published on this for the last 50 years, you can, you can get a graph like this. And this is like basically a, a, a way to understand various moments in history. 1964 is when this thing starts to take off. This is the year that... The, that's right. THC's chemical structure was elucidated exactly into its stereoisomer, stereochemical form. We actually knew in the 40s roughly what it looked like, but this was when we really figured it out, the modern era of Dr. Mishulam. And then there was a flurry of research after the discovery of THC uh, through the late 60s. And then it peaked, as you can see, in 1972, 1973, when we have all those studies underway by the federal government trying to decide, you know, about marijuana. They'd funded a lot of research there and around the world. But then, you know, Nixon said, you know, I'm throwing that in the trash. And there was a decline in research because there was less funding and less interest. And all through the dark ages of the 80s, uh, Reagan was president. He says it's the most dangerous drug known to man. Uh, and we haven't even begun to uh, determine all the ill effects. And then, in 1988, uh, the first cannabinoid receptor is discovered, CB1. For a long time, people didn't know how cannabis worked in the body. They thought it was nonspecific. We finally found a specific you know, key for it. And uh, then, uh, 1992, uh, endocannabinoid was discovered, a chemical that binds to that, and uh, all this research starts to go, go off the charts, literally. This is when things really, and then of course 1996, California legalizes cannabis for medicinal purposes and many states to follow. And really we haven't stopped growing this research. Basically 2.3 publications a day for the last 20 years. Um, and this is another way to look at the numbers. It, you know, far, the pharmacology and chemistry, the, that's the bulk of the research. A lot of, we know so much about the chemistry and pharmacology of cannabis constituents. Thousands of articles on the endocannabinoid system. But if you want to know, hey, how many human beings have been studied with cannabis and cannabinoids? That's uh, one study that kind of cut off at 2009 said 6,100 human beings had been studied uh, in over 110 controlled clinical trials. In the U.S., we've done all these clinical uh, studies with cannabis from the federal farm, and about a third of those 33 or so, three dozen, have been gold standard design. And most of that, that is to say they're randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. And, and most of those are actually positive outcome. And then the federal government has been doing a study for the last 40 years where they've been supplying cannabis to a few patients, but they never collected any longitudinal data officially from those patients. So the research is very vast. And I'm just giving you a, a, a taste of how, how this evidence base can be read. Like we've done so much studies on nausea and vomiting with cannabis that you can make a chart like this. This is called like level four. Uh, one evidence in medicine where you can stack up trials and trials and say, do they all say one thing? And, you know, on this side is favors treatment, on this side is favors control. And so a stack of trials of 18 trials with 13 with cannabis can show you that, you know, um, it works for nausea and vomiting. Uh, and some of this I reviewed in this article. Some of these are the trials that they've done in the United States. Um, HIV, neuropathy, spasticity, I think 
those in this room are probably familiar with a lot of this, but it's important to know that all of, a lot of these also funded by the University of, uh, by the California State, uh, and many of these are all positive outcome clinical trials. So, you know, to, to give some credence to the patients who did the studies, the researchers who recruited them, and all the staff who worked on those, it's, it's quite a lot of work to do a controlled clinical trial. It takes money, it takes time, and it's very difficult with the research environment being the way it is in terms of federal supply of a Schedule One substance. So, but th these are like kind of the official cannabinoid, cannabis-based uh, medicines that are in the FDA-regulated sector. You've got THC pills, um, you've got these nadalone pills, which are similar to THC in similar structure. You have a whole plant cannabis extract, a CO2 mixture that a, a British pharmaceutical company is doing trials in the US on and you have those cannabis cigarettes from the Mississippi supply. What's sad is we need to have another box next to here and have all the cannabis that's locally produced in, you know, in, in state medical cannabis programs and, and beyond, but the government makes it very hard to do research like uh, with the, that local cannabis in clinical settings. So that's uh, what's missing from here, but that's the bulk of the cannabis that's being used in the US, so it's unfortunate that we have these uh, only these in sort of uh, official FDA hands, but um, I thought uh, people like to make an issue, okay, this is called Sativex and it's something special, but actually, you know, it is uh, hash oil. It's a highly refined hash oil made with CO2 extraction and Sativex is basically sativa extract, Sativex for short. So don't, don't think it's something new or different because that's, um, and I, I, I made that point by showing you their patent. This is their, one of their patents and they say basically, look, this is the steps that we use to prepare an herbal drug extract from medicinal cannabis. You heat, we heat it, we extract it, and we, we chop it up, and you know, these kind of things. It's, it's, here's the recipe. So, um, you know, it's, um, th these are things that have been being done by human beings for a long time, cannabis extracts, but they have been able to, because of the freedom they, the government allowed them, uh, they were able to put a lot of money and get some scientists and do it in a refined fashion in a greenhouse in the UK. And they, they, you know, they said this, but it's... And then you should know that the THC pills uh, that I showed you, the Marinol pills, are actually, this is in some testimony that was in the um, Administrative Law Judge, uh, Federal DEA, the, the guy who runs that federal farm, he has been using the marijuana that he's allowed, allowed to grow by the government and extracting the THC from it and selling that to pharmaceutical companies who then manufacture generic Marinol. The Marinol pill, the purple pill, is a liquid uh, soft gelatin capsule of a THC uh, in sesame seed oil. But interestingly enough, that's, some of that is being directly extracted from marijuana. So uh, just kind of the, some of the, the ways in which the ecological and who has access to whole plant cannabis and how they kind of make money off of that and this whole thing. I just wanted you to be aware. And you know, all of these things, I, you know, this is the 37 definition of marijuana. Any resin extracted from a cannabis plant, every compound, manufacture, salt, derivative mixture, preparation of such a plant or resin, you know, that's what the they were really careful in 37 in crafting this definition of marijuana. It was very, uh, very, um, and, you know, and that they were very interested in talking about sterilized seeds and things like that. But, um, so it's all, it's all marijuana, not cannabis. And um, so, you know, how, how cannabis works in the body, um, you know, you, you know about the cannabinoids, there's 20, there's just about six dozen of them. There's also terpenoids and flavonoids and phytosterols all have medicinal uh, properties. Uh, the heating of cannabinoid acids, THC or CBD, are the two most important ones to know about. But uh, if you heat them up for five minutes, you decarboxylate and, uh, at, at this temperature. But if you heat them with a flame, it just takes a few seconds to decarboxylate. Um, I think uh, everyone is familiar with what uh, they can you see the electron microscope view of cannabis. That's what, this, that's what I'm trying to show you here. These are the glandular trichomes, and inside these, uh, these heads is where the cannabinoids are, are produced by the plant. This is the business end of cannabis. Uh, the different um, chemicals that come together to produce the enzymes that uh, make the uh, cannabis. This is the pharmaceutical factory. This is the cannabis production here. 
whole, it, this is essentially a, a resin, like, like if you had maple syrup you know, on your pancakes, maple syrup is a resin from the maple tree, sap. So this is a sap, cannabis is, cannabis is sap up close. We've sequenced the genome of cannabis. Uh, so there's lots of genetic diversity and like evidence science that's coming out about the varieties of cannabis. As I told you, it's a very late evolved advanced plant. There's more genetic diversity in cannabis than there is in dogs. So um, how you take it into the body, um, lungs, smoke, through vaporization of smoke. Uh, and it's the time course of that is like a bolus. So like you take, it comes on, maximal effect half an hour, it lasts about two to three hours. Uh, the gut, you can take in these different extracts, which is more available absorption time. And there's a topical application on the skin, less well studied, but, but is there. Um, people have taken vaporizers and studied them at, 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 in San Francisco, and they showed that the time course of THC disappearance in the bloodstream at different amounts of THC percentage um, is very similar with smoked and vaporized. That's what those, these graphs are showing. This was a human study. Um, THC, or this is a lot of this is based on THC, so, but uh, that's sort of what a lot of the, the science has been um, elucidated on because THC is in the, in the drug formulary. But um, it's, uh, it, it clears from the plasma, and, but it has a first pass effect in the liver which means that oral administration produces a more psychoactive, uh, potentially psychoactive, but longer lasting uh, effect because this metabolite of THC plus passes into the blood brain barrier more easily. Uh, it does distribute into breast milk, but there's also endocannabinoids found in breast milk, which are very important to uh, thriving of, a, of the infant. And uh, um, these are just some of the other details Okay, so ph the pharmacodynamics is the, how the uh, body, or how the drug is affecting the body. And um, this is really interesting because this system in the body that I told you about, which is 600 million years old in evolution, is a big breakthrough in the understanding of human physiology. And very few doctors and health workers in general are familiar about it. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of ability to translate all those reams of research you know, into a meaningful fashion into the educational curriculum of, of uh, medical and health professionals. But I, want, I wanted to share some of this because this is part of that ecological relationship between humans and cannabis. So you have to, you have to know that there's these receptors which are found all throughout the body. Um, they look like this and they have these natural ligands that look like this. Um, this is what the picture of the, one of the receptors looks like. I, I won't go into too much of detail, but uh, what's really fascinating about these, this system in the body is that it goes in a backwards fashion, especially in the nerves. It, it does things in the immune cells too, but I'm, right now I'm talking about the nerves and the brain, the neurons. So normally neural transmission, that 1936 Nobel Prize was the discovery of this chemical and how it comes across the cleft like that. Actually, they didn't know that much that, that then, but this is that chemical, acetylcholine, and it comes across and binds on the other, other, other neuron. It's called classical neurotransmission. But cannabinoids uh, basically go backwards across the synapse. Uh, that's what they do, they go backwards. Uh, and, and that allows them to do retrograde <coughs> Uh, feedback. They, give, they can give feedback to the other neuron. Hey, you're secreting too much of those other neurotransmitters. That's making me sick. It's making it's toxic. Or you need more of this other one. And they, they perform a neurofeedback kind of conductor symphony approach. And I have a video of that. This was published in the journal Nature. So one of the things that happens when you have an electrical impulse coming into a neuron, calcium is released. And in this case, this neurotransmitter is called glutamate. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. But if you get too much glutamate, like in the source of a stroke or brain injury, you can have toxic damage, or even in, in a lot of neurodegenerative disorders, um, you get too much excitation. So you can see this, each, each electrical impulse is coming down, calcium is being uh, in, influxed, and then these glutamates are going across. But now there's a lot of signals coming in. You're getting tons of glutamate, excitotoxicity. So here comes, a cannabinoid um, uh, that's to the rescue. Basically, it's being synthesized on demand. This is one of the endocannabinoids. And it goes over and binds in a backwards fashion, and it shuts this thing down. This, this, this Nature Part article was called the Synaptic Circuit Breaker. 
this is a very significant function in, in, the, uh, in the neuron, and sometimes this is not working. And the nice thing is, is that these uh, cannabinoids from herbal cannabis can, can do this or stimulate this process to, to occur more effect, efficaciously. Um, these are just some pictures to show you how widespread cannabinoid receptors are in the brain. These are slices of a, of a monkey that was sacrificed, but before they sacrificed the monkey, they injected him or her with a radio tracer that binds to the cannabinoid receptors. And so all the areas that light up that are red are high dense concentrations. Frontal lobe, and this area called the basal ganglia, which is a lot of movement, motor, um, and then this is the cerebellum. And the green is also le it's just less dense. So you can see, you slice the brain all the way from front to the back, you have a lot of cannabinoid receptors. This was a similar um, study that was done in, in a human being. They, he, was, he or she was not sacrificed, but uh, they were given a PET scan. And you can see here um, that these guys said that cannabinoid receptors are really abundant in the, in the human brain. 10 times higher than opioid receptors. So it's a very widespread system. And the science is very clear that this system is important in a numerous physiological processes, everything from feeding behavior, energy balance, pain perception, motor control, to learning and memory and immune responses, nerve protection, bone growth. You, you, you know, it's, it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, I think this is the fact that doctors are educated on this is, is, a, is another uh, outcropping of Schedule One prohibition because basically, oh, well, how we don't have something we can use to manipulate this system, so why should I learn about it? That's, a, that, that's essentially kind of how we're, if education is driven by pharmaceutical interest, then that's why you wouldn't have learned about this. But if you're interested in like actually how, you know, physiology and health works and, um, you know, because this system is also stimulated with electrical acupuncture and it's stimulated with, uh, with the, the runner's high. There's a lot of things that probably we could learn more about in terms of normal physiological activities if we studied more about this. But certainly in terms of drug pharmacology, cannabis effects, you have to understand this system in order to know why it works the way it does. And that's why you know, people knew for so long, if you're taking chemotherapy, you should use some marijuana because it'll ease the nausea and vomiting. But nobody knew why. Now we know that cannabinoid receptors are in the part of the brain that govern the emesis response. That's, a, that's an ancient evolutionary response because you, know, you come across poisons in the environment and you have to vomit them up or you're gonna die. So you have to have a circuit to, to vomit. There's an emergency doc in, the, in a room and he, he can tell you the necessity for having the ability to, to vomit in order to, um, to survive. So this is the system that cannabinoids uh, help to slow down, calm down, so that uh, you can, um, you know, tolerate your chemotherapy. Uh, the neuroprotective aspects of cannabinoids are, is, is a really fascinating area. And I wanted to show you that um, this is that famous patent that's talked about. These, this, this scientist right here, Julius Axelrod, he's a Nobel laureate in medicine. And he, when he was working at NIH with other researchers, they said, well, these cannabinoids are so impressive in terms of ways to protect the brain and way more antioxidants than vitamin C and vitamin E. And boy, well, we better write down this idea of using them to protect the brain and to antioxidize. And then, you know, um, we're just going to patent that idea because that's what we do with good ideas, you know. So um, as opposed to, well, you know, we should tell the government who's paying for all this research that, you know, he should... Uh, stop classifying cannabinoids as dangerous when they're actually, you know, uh, so beneficial. So um, this is a quote from their, their uh, invention, uh, Pranton, saying that these compounds can prevent, arrest, or treat neurological damage in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, HIV, autoimmune, encephalitis, and on, including brain surgery, trauma, concussion, spinal shock. You know, it's, it's very interesting to see how that kind of future and um, yeah, this is a little bit about pain. You should know that if you're interested in the treatment of pain, that cannabinoid system is, is all over the pain circuits from the ascending and descending pathways all the way to the immune cells. And I wanted to show you that the body responds to, uh, we've done research where we constrict different nerves in animals and we can show that we can suppress their pain with uh, cannabinoids. And I, I, I didn't show this to you, but also the, the, the animal's body responds to these nerve injuries by upping its own endocannabinoid system. 
Um, so some of these neurological things I thought were so interesting that maybe you'd want to see kind of them in action. It's, it's very hard to collect research. Even Francis Young, the DEA's own judge, Sorry. who took medical... That was the other video I wasn't going to show you. We lost the audio. So, um, let me uh, let's, uh, cancel this. Okay. So he said, "Just he said, this is a Parkinson's patient in, in Israel who's just showing what's called a micrographia and ataxia." Uh, and obviously the tremor of Parkinson's disease. Um, he's a legal medical cannabis patient in Israel. Uh, uh, you know, he's no risk of arrest from any state, federal, international authorities. He's completely prescribed cannabis and uh, prefers to, to combust it and inhale it. And, um, you know, what's, what's really remarkable in these movement disorder patients is that you can actually see these neuromodulatory effects, like uh, instant, nearly it seems instantaneously. I think he takes a little bit more on the floor, so I'll skip that. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to get the dose right. <laughs> Just showing, hey, I can move my hand here, and I don't have that that tremor that I was showing you before. So, the music's a little goofy, but um, he also shows that I can he can write better. He has improved handwriting. So now you might have a sense of okay, why, how, and why that's working. That's and I have some other videos you can look these up online. This this is the kind of best you can do in terms of research to see this kind of thing is to go to the internet and look at videos. Um, I've done some research that, uh, where I try to review the pain literature and uh, I'll just show you that all kinds of pain syndromes are treated with cannabis. And you should also know that the California has done all these uh, research trials, over 300 human subjects in the last 10 years studying uh, cannabis in gold standard trials. This is a, these are some pictures of how those trials are done. You take that cannabis and the tin cans from the feds, and you have a patient here with HIV neuropathy smoking in the San Francisco General Hospital, and then you have them rate their pain on a before and after way on a scale. And the, the, everybody's blinded to what they're getting, whether it's cannabis cigarettes or the placebo. But uh, the placebo patients, which are the ones up here, they don't have a drop in the pain scores like the, uh, the cannabis patients do. And that's what the, uh, the you know, that's how you re look at, interpret that data, that there is this positive effect uh, in, in pain. So some of the research that I have done, though, I took, I went to the access site of a doctor who, who actually uh, used cannabis as part of his pain rehab practice. And uh, it was over here in this place called Centralia, Washington. And uh, he had all these, this is pre-electronic medical records, he had all these charts. I went through them and found the ones where the patient was using cannabis for medical authorization. Uh, and basically there were um, 137 such patients and they represented, uh, on average, they're about 47 years of age. And um, they represented in total 225, or sorry, 236 years of medical cannabis use. So that is the number of years that they've been uh, using cannabis under medical authorization and added up over the entire sample. So that's how much uh, medical cannabis experience. And then I also collected their three-digit zip codes just to kind of get a sense of uh, the pro proximity which would, with which they were relative to this clinical site to, to sort of see that they were coming from areas. This is where the clinic was located, you know, uh, actually here, which are, um, which are um, you know, geographically nearer. As you get further away, there's less patients coming. Um, 
the syndromes of pain that were treated uh, went through these patients' records and classified what kind of pain they had by this category system. And all of these types of pain were found in the patient sample. Um, and most common being what's called myofascial pain, and neuropathic pain, uh, and discogenic pain, or so a certain type of back pain, followed by arthritic pain, um, central pain, fibromyalgia. There was just a report today, National Pain Report surveyed fibromyalgia, a couple thousand fibromyalgia patients, and they said that cannabis was the most superior treatment for them compared to other pharmaceuticals that, that just came out today. Fibromyalgia pain syndrome was 19 of the patients in the sample. Um, so these patients were had traumatic brain injuries, Hep C virus, gunshot wounds, shrapnel wounds, spinal cord injuries. Uh, uh, some of the patients' uh, stories and cases look like this. Uh, you can look at all of these in the, the paper we published. I put all of these in the appendix. But here's a 52-year-old male who had all these pain problems. Uh, he had failed spinal surgery and a lot of rotator cuff injuries. And he had been using marijuana and found it that gave him the best pain relief of anything. He used two or three inhalations, improved his pain drastically. Anyway, I don't want to go through all these details, but you just to, just to kind of what you can collect from medical records of, of, of uh, medical cannabis using patients. It's quite remarkable and, and does a lot to um, uh, show you a, a more accurate medical picture of the way that cannabis is integrated into their medical uh, care. Um, so uh, some of these, sorry, are all the um, acronyms and shorthands. This is severe left ulnar neuropathy. There's a nerve uh, on the arm and osteoarthritis related low back and hip pain. Um, and then she said that marijuana daily with no side effects, only thing she is now using for pain. And they've been authorized, 35 year old female authorized for two and a half years. And here's somebody with Lou Gehrig's disease and had been using for 3.38 years. Anyway, I won't, I, there's too many cases to go through, but I just wanted you to, to wanted to show in this piece of access that there was major hurdles related to accessing medical cannabis. Um, these patients uh, had physicians who were unwilling to authorize them. They had legal problems related to the use, difficulties finding a supply. Uh, and many of them, at about uh, 26 of the patients, 19%, there was actual records where they said this was the only medicine that they were, uh, was effective for them. <coughs> there were a few cases where people reduced or stopped their opioid use. Um, so this is the kind of thing that helps to dispel stereotypes about valid and invalid treatment with botanical and non-botanical cannabinoid-based medicines. That was my conclusion. As I said, that was the access piece. And there was this de delivery piece where I went to a medical cannabis dispensary then, not the medical practice, but a site in which after they are authorized, they go to receive treatment. And I gave these patients, and I watched it disappear over the course of four days. I got approval from the Fed, the National Institutes of Health, um, to, to recruit subjects in this site of dispensing, which was um, really excellent and allowed me to do this study. Uh, so I was able to um, recruit patients like this um, in order, in, and understand a little bit more about how patients respond to a particular strain. And um, that was in uh, a urban center in Washington state. So this was anonymous and unsighted to protect privacy, but it was an urban center. It was in, had been in operation for two, over two years. Um, 600 patients had been served since its opening. About 100 physicians had sought treatment. Uh, pa patients of 100 physicians had sought treatment there. Uh, they had three employees, full-time, two part-time. Uh, so this is kind of 71 were potentially eligible. But um, because that, I wanted to sort of see how many people were drawing from that particular 32 ounce lot. Um, there was 71, but 34 didn't decline. So I got 37 of those to um, fill out a questionnaire on site. Um, and then I'm gonna show you some of the results of that questionnaire. And then uh, a, a few of them returned some materials to me with another questionnaire that I sent them home with. So again, um, most of them, um, male predominance on average, um, the age was 38, uh, sorry, 40, 38 for males, 47 for females, so on average 41, mean age. Income, on average, 40% of them, less than $20,000 a year. 
Um, most of them had some form of health insurance, but that 54% of that was Medicare, Medicaid, Caucasian predominance. And you know what's really fascinating, I did not do this study based on you know, diseases or syndromes or patient records. I went to a site where cannabis was disappearing, you know, a particular batch of a single clonal lot. And I just watched it disappear for a few days. And in that lot, whoever came to receive it, whoever did my survey, I asked them what their condition was in Washington. They have a qualifying list of diagnoses. And all 10 at that time qualifying diagnoses shows up in this particular batch of patients who are drawing from this lot. Uh, mostly pain, others uh, nausea, vomiting, appetite loss, um, others HIV, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and, and you know, lots and lots of qualifiers. Let me see if we do that time. Um, so uh, symptoms that they were being treated with, anxiety, mood, nausea, appetite, uh, you know, a huge list here. And some of the, some of the symptoms, they, they, they gave me all kinds of, of verbal feedback, free responses, uh, which I also included in the paper we published on this uh, particular batch of patients. Um, what I also did was use standard metrics to measure their quality of life related to their health. And their quality of life related to their health was 37 on a scale of zero to 50. And um, that's basically the same as you get for people who are amputees, 37. Like if you, this is like standard published data on quality of life related to loss of a limb. Or if, uh, if you have cancer, about that good. Or 31 if you have heart failure. So this, uh, doing these kind of surveys allows you to see what their health is like relative to other chronically ill populations that have been studied. Um, Anyway, in another study, uh, I kind of just watched the cannabis disappear. I showed that to you and I collected some data on how much money it costs to run that cannabis dispensary for that particular, uh, for a particular four month cycle. Um, and what was interesting is some of the patients returned surveys to me and told me that, um, you know, um, when I have plants, I feel a relationship of love and respect and awe with the plant. We, have, we are both created of the same source maker. Uh, you know, this kind of spiritual sentiments relating to human uh, contact with, uh, with this plant. Um, three subjects when queried endorsed spiritual religious views regarding cannabis, explicitly noting the plant's natural origins as distinguished from synthetic drugs. So the uh, final thing I wanted to show you is this piece on distress. So in addition to the surveys about their health-related quality of life, I also asked them about what their mental health was like and how they cope, how they feel about their criminal status under federal law, and how they cope with that. Um, so, uh, sorry, this is a lot of words here, but uh, the mean psychological distress index was 2.5 times higher than that found in the general population. Uh, and there was a moderate amount of distress related to the criminality of marijuana in federal law. 76% reporting previous exposures to 119 separate drug enforcement tactics. So, you know, just to remind you, this is that federal marijuana death penalty uh, where they actually, you can do some calculation and find out what quantity of marijuana uh, plants uh, or quantity that, you know, puts you in, in to be qualified for this, uh, you know, uh, most serious punishment. And, uh, you know, so this kind of uh, approach is a very easy way, if you're gonna kill people for cannabis or at least put that into law, then you can certainly deny them various forms of dignity. Um, you know, searches, surveillance, raids, trials, confidential informant placements, arrest, incarceration, child removal, job loss, home addiction, asset forfeiture, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I asked, and also assault injury related to underground market. So I asked these patients, have you ever been exposed to these tactics before? specifically exposed, threatened, or have you feared them? So, um, so one, one subject, uh, a 28-year-old male who has chronic stomach pain, nausea, PTSD, depression, um, uh, said that they had um, felt extremely, extreme distress to the criminality of marijuana. An another woman who um, was a breast cancer patient where she had, um, I don't think I included her here, um, but 
you can see that uh, uh, some of these patients talked about this HIV patient says it's very difficult to grow while I'm in federal housing, and um, you know all, all kind of. It was really nice to be able to kind of hear the perspective of the chronically ill medical patient and how they talked about their um, their basically their um, dealt with the social exclusion of the laws outside of my marijuana use. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I feel it is an outrage that I'm forced to break the law simply to acquire and use marijuana to provide an acceptable quality of life. This is somebody just freely wrote that on one of my surveys, a 47-year-old male with, uh, these, with these disorders, or self-reported. So um, you can see that um, these patients have been exposed to all kinds of drug control enforcement tactics, arrest, trial, incarceration, uh, searches, surveillance, raids, home eviction. And, uh, and, and these are specific ones they had been subjected to, and these are the other ones that they had been feared. They feared. And so I, I collected all the numbers on that for all this, this group of 36, 37 patients. Um, and then I asked the question, well, um, how much distress do you have related to the criminality of marijuana in federal law? Not at all, a little bit, moderately, quite a bit, extremely. Okay, those are the choices. And this is a graph of those, how those people chose, um, like here, nine of them chose moderately, two of them chose quite a bit, seven chose a little bit. And then comparing that with what their level of standard mental well-being is, this metric of psychological distress is over here. You know, the, the higher this goes, the more um, kind of a higher indicator of mental distress that you have. Uh, so that, that is to say, kind of depression, anxiety, uh, other thoughts that are, you know, con con constitute behavioral um, health issues. So the more they felt related to, the more distress they reported about the criminality of marijuana in federal law, the more, the lower were their scores on this mental illness scale. So uh, that's kind of an interesting, like, it's more rational <laughs> to be quite a bit distressed if you are quite a bit distressed, it's more likely in my data that you were a men more mentally healthy in the more mentally healthy group. There were some outliers too, uh, over here and over here. Right? So I just wanted to show you that little piece of it. And then the, another thing where I asked them about drug law enforcement tactics. Um, so this is, um, if you look at the, the scores of mental distress uh, related to how many drug law enforcement tactics they've been exposed to. Uh, so this group, the people that had been exposed to eight drug law enforcement tactics were here. People that had just been exposed to a few were up here. And here, it's, it's kind of, there's actually not a lot of rhyme or reason to this, but it looked kind of interesting. There might be something more to this, like related to the more exposures you have to drug enforcement tactics, it kind of worries you. And then eventually you get uh, some, I'm sorry, this is the um, graph down here. Of the, these are the actual number of subjects. This, this is the number of drug law enforcement uh, uh, tactics. So the more tactics you're exposed to, these 12 or more here, their levels of distress are very low in terms of their, um, um, you know, on that scale of psychological distress. So there's kind of an interesting phenomenon here that, that deserves further study. So I'm going to sum up now. This has been talking for quite some time. And I hope uh, we can talk a little bit and have some discussion. But this is a little bit of the way to study the political ecology of uh, human cannabis relationships and the mental distress piece in, in the medical marijuana system. And you can see that you can break it up into access, delivery, and distress, and hopefully, um, you know, get some, some uh, insight. This is a, a, a planned website series that I'm hoping to launch with some friends um, where we can kind of put some good information out there about how to uh, educate physicians and the general public on different ways that you can use cannabis in a, in a healthful fashion. So I just thought I'd throw that up there. Um, so without, without further ado, uh, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, did you extend the relationship between acetylcholine and uh, THC? Because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't acetylcholine uh, present or associated with nootropic drugs? So would that mean like uh, cannabis would be possibly? Be
Well, um, yeah, nootropic drugs are still an understudied area. We don't really know. He's talking about drugs that make you smarter, you know, uh, enhance your cognitive functioning. Acetylcholine is, is actually involved in, in memory and alertness and has other functions in the brain. And the endocannabinoid system would be involved in the regulation of acetylcholine uh, levels, but other, drug, other neurotransmitters too. It's quite a, a complex uh, equation. So I, I don't know. Uh, the extent to which you can pinpoint that. We probably need some method to study it, but certainly there, there may be an effect. And, and we do know that cannabinoids are neuroprotective and can, uh, in some animal studies, they've given high potent cannabinoids to mice and then shown um, that their hippocampus uh, has more neurons in it compared to the ones who didn't get that. So that's called neurogenesis. And so there's probably something there because those neurons were integrated into the ne hippocampal network. The, the, there, there's certainly a, a neuro, pro neuro effect of, of cannabinoids in some research which could translate to improved cognitive function, nootropic. I don't, but we have to look at that. Yeah. Cannabinoid receptors are only there for cannabis? Or? No, no, they're, they're there for them. They, they, they evolved, like I said, 600 million years yeah. ago. They've been there a lot longer. Cannabis showed up on the scene 36 million years ago, and it produced this resin, uh, and that resin was very popular with humans. Uh, it, it's kind of a, uh, Michael Pollan, is this, he calls it the botany of desire. Like the, the plant benefits from us having this close relationship because it gets to move around the world. It, it evolved in one place in the steppes of, you know, of Asia, somewhere, India, China, Afghanistan. And now it's in every country in the world. It didn't, it is wind pollinated, but it didn't get up and carry itself all over the world. I mean, humans did that. So uh, it kind of tapped into that system and we co-evolved with it over the years because humans have selected certain strains and selected certain types. Um, but the cannabinoid system is doing all kinds of things in the body for homeostasis, regulating all those essential functions of sleep, mood, appetite, memory, inflammation. And uh, the cannabis plant is just sort of a very full of compounds that can interact with that system, which is very nice. Yeah. Oh, does it? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Yes, sir. Um, AM404 is on the cannabinoid that like cinnamon, right? Is there anything in the cannabinoid like it also blocks the enzymes like cannabinoid that would uh, move the cannabinoid also cinnamon that would be responsible, or is it all? Or mostly the right. And Tylenol is acetaminophen, and it's been, we didn't know how it worked for so long. And the most solid me mechanism that's been published is this particular mechanism involving the enzyme that breaks down uh, anandamide, uh, FA, that it blocks that, maybe promotes the endocannabinoid system, and that could explain its pain relieving and fever reducing properties. But um, I don't, I mean, uh, so yes, Tylenol works in part through the endocannabinoid system. I don't know if it has other targets, but it certainly is, um, you know, uh, I'm sure other, you act, talk to any old school doctor, you ask them how Tylenol works, they won't really be able to tell you. But now you know more than the doctor about how Tylenol works. And that, that is exactly, that's been published in Nature. And you know, in my own residency classes, you still hear people say, we don't know how Tylenol works. And so wait, there was this 2007 article in Nature where they, they show that it, it works in this particular fashion. So, um, but you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to, that there's probably other drugs that are doing something with the endocannabinoid system. We don't even really, we haven't looked for it, so we don't know. There's somebody else over here, I thought that. Okay. So how do you see things change in Washington? Last year. Washington State or yeah, Washington, D.C.? State, State. <laughs> yeah, Washington State is, uh, well, we're waiting to their, them to open their 502 stores, right? And it's like, we couldn't really tell what happened in Colorado until they opened their stores, you know, on January 1 of this year, right? So I think it's going to feel different when the stores are opening, so we'll, we'll see. I, I'm, it's sort of, you don't believe it until it happens with that kind of legal taxed, you know, sales. Um, it certainly is a, um, 
it's a complicated thing because of the way the medical cannabis system is, is regulated there in, in not a centralized fashion. Um, and uh, yeah, there's still some federal prosecutions going on of, of medical patients. Uh, there's one called the Kettle Falls Six you can read about that just, you know, uh, they were under the law and authorized and the prosecutors are still going after them, federal prosecutors. So there's, you know, it's not just a state issue. We have these attorney, U.S. attorneys over there. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm still kind of reserving judgment to see what happens with this whole mess there. But um, I do know once a market gets going, that things are going to look and feel different. But, but that's supposed to come in the summer. Um, yeah. Right. I don't know. It's. I mean, I don't know if those guys have like one real reason. You know, I mean, there's a few people that that have the power to uh, current under current law to change the schedule, the way the marijuana is is controlled in federal law. But the kind of people who get to those levels of power have learned to play politics their whole lives. Right. That's a lot. Of, like people who might be more liberal minded, and you know ready to change things when they get in. You know, let's say you started a new job. I'm going to change the way things are being done around here because that's the way kind of person I am. Well, you may not end up being the Attorney General of the United States because with that kind of thinking and mentality, we kind of select for conservative people as it goes up. And, you know, but people are humans still and they, they can change and they can, you know, spontaneous things happen. I, I'm open to that, all those possibilities. I mean, I know that people at the top also have loved ones and health problems and things like that too, that, you know, they need access to this thing. They have endocannabinoid systems. They, they have a pain and suffering and have to deal with a medical system that's been hobbled by lack of access. At, um, but, you know, we've always had this privilege game too. Well, yeah, we go around those laws because we can't, you know, so that sustains that. If we didn't have that privilege system, then, you know, things would have changed more quickly, I think. So we kind of it's, it's really a matter of when the privileged people are going to leverage that privilege to, to benefit more people. So um, I can't, I, but at least you can kind of look at the various forces that are involved and, and we can kind of uh, continue to press on it. But I don't know if there's one reason or it's a confluence of things. And, yeah, did you have a question, Paul? Yeah. I do. How could you tell that? Yeah. How could I tell? Oh, well, you know, we've been talking, so <laughs> this is uh, Paul Von Hartman. He spoke yesterday at Humboldt. He's a graduate in 1978 of wildlife ecology and journalism and uh, has uh, been a kind of a whale ecologist for most of his life and then uh, recognized the value of cannabis and he wants to study terpene profile from hemp to help to reduce the global warming impacts of UV radiation. Uh, and that's a very reasonable uh, idea because those terpenes in cannabis can uh, potentially help to uh, reduce the amount of um, uh, increased cloud cover and things that could potentially help the planet warming. So hopefully Humboldt becomes a site where cannabis can be grown under the industrial hemp rules that the feds have recently uh, promulgated. It's just a matter of the Attorney General of the state of California implementing that law and I think they have a month or two left to actually write the regs, but uh, we should, it's, anyway, that's Paul for you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I wish that, yeah, that's a great, it's, a, it's another open area. I, he's talking about, so we've always talked about, and I apologize for leaving that piece of it out. Um, I mean, a lot of the hullabaloo in the 30s was not over hemp seeds, uh, which were a food, but it was over the resin of the plant. But it turns out in prohibiting the resin, we made it difficult to access a very useful food, the hemp seed, which has a complete protein content, all essential amino acids that you need in order to survive, to make the right proteins, and all essential fatty acids that you need to make neurons. And uh, it's very easy to grow and cheap, but as Paul has pointed out, they don't put it on the UN list of food and agricultural substances that are needed for you know global malnutrition needs because of cannabis prohibition. So it's another kind of 
horrible hit. If you don't have those essential fatty acids and, and nutrients, uh, you will uh, not thrive. But whether you combine those with taking phytocannabinoids, I, I haven't seen that and it should be looked at. It would be interesting, uh, you know, a lot of variables there, but we could, we could certainly look at it. You know, I'm not aware. Oh, yes, back to you. Um, the fatty acids in cannabis, like DHA as opposed to acetinol, I think that's what it is, uh, it's transformed in body and through the glucosa, glucosa hexaenol, enol ethanol. Sorry, I feel like I get mixed up all the time, but it's an, that's an endocannabinoid, and there are some fatty acids linked to hemp seed that are turned into. That's right. Yeah, these are the precursors for, for the uh, phospholipid bilayer, and those phospholipid bilayers are the precursors to endocannabinoids. It's, you're exactly right. So um, there was a, a doctor who's uh, named um, um, John McPartland. He's a D doctor of osteopathy in, I think, Vermont. Uh, he's written about the care and feeding of the endocannabinoid system. I think he's recently published an article on that. So he talks about dietary sources of precursors to um, boost the body's production of these cannabinoids, endocannabinoids. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to, uh, that you can look at to, to look at more of that. Yeah. But yeah, so you're talking a lot about um, what I assume to be as a PhD space marijuana like in these different types mm -hmm. of studies and like right. could you elaborate maybe on some of the other research studies that have been done on on other cannabinoids and the relationship between THC, CBD, CBN or maybe other terpenes and things in the plant that might right. have a, an alternative or combined effect? Yeah, I mean CBD of course is big popular now with the seizure uh, disorder treatments. But we've been known about the anticonvulsant properties of, of cannabis for many hundreds of years, but it's now kind of finally breaking through on CNN, uh, breaking news, you know, 200 year uh, fact has been discovered. Okay, so, um, but what I'm, what I'm uh, but unfortunately, um, the studies with CBD have been small uh, and kind of um, a little bit old. But they were there. They've shown CBD uh, can um, has an anti-convulsive properties for, for long-term epilepsy patients. They did that in Brazil with human subjects in a placebo. And they also did a study in Germany with CBD, comparing it with a standard antipsychotic. And they gave it to schizophrenics, and they showed that it was better than that standard antipsychotic drug. Uh, CBD has been shown to slow diabetic retinopathy in animal models of of that disease, you know, it's a leading cause of blindness in the country, is diabetic retinopathy, and all those doctors are milking money off of Medicare by doing retina tests on diabetic patients to prevent this disease, which, you know, keeps proliferating. So, I mean, I'm just uh, saying that there's a lot of research on CBD in animal studies, neuroprotective, and I showed you that patent. THCV, tetrahydrocannabivarin, is, um, is a very interesting cannabinoid as well. It's been studied for weight loss and smoking cessation um, and because uh, it actually has antagonist properties, a little bit of antagonist properties of the CB1 receptor. Uh, I know that the pharmaceutical company that gets all the um, money and, and had raised a bunch of money has strains of just THCV, CBDV, and you know, all the whole range of them. They're just growing up plants like that and they're doing trials and trying to develop each of these in a particular fashion. So. GW Pharmaceuticals, um, they, were, they took all their genetics in the 1990s from the Dutch seed banks. They bought a big batch of, tea, of, of uh, cannabis seeds, of ge genetics that had been collected from all over the world. Two guys from California had started that seed bank. Um, what's that? Is it DNA? Uh, it was, well, it's seeds which have DNA in them, but yeah. I mean, it was, it was enough to get going. So they, they used that and then, to, uh, and then they got permission from the government of the UK to create um, big greenhouses that they privately run. We, we were never allowed to do that in the US. People have asked the researchers, hey, can we have our own seed collection that we can buy from a Dutch seed bank and start our own greenhouses and, and do our own pharmaceutical production? No, but if you ask the UK, they said yes. So now their stuff is coming over into the US. They'd like to produce here too, but uh, they haven't gotten that permission. But that's just an example of 
because of what they're doing, though, we have a lot of data on cannabis extracts and how they're useful in various conditions. But um, we have to be careful about the, the issues of monopolization and proprietary control of this, of this commonwealth plant. That's the big issue, you know. Um, so the debate isn't no more is it useful, it's like who's going to control it? Who's going to control that utility? You know, that, as far as your question back there is concerned. How do you get people kind of out of the dark and dark political realm and ask about capital punishment? You know, I mean, the people that get so disadvantaged can probably just not be born, maybe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> I mean, there's also economic <laughs> reasons that people are doing <laughs> What's that? Right, a lot of factors. Yeah, I mean, the media is a very media is a huge fa influence on. I mean, how many people in this room were taught in elementary school that marijuana is dangerous and bad? Okay, you also might, you may have been taught say no, don't talk to strangers, don't you know other useful things that you might want to know as a kid. But those things they they, they go in deep. That's very early early messaging. Authority figures tell you something is wrong or bad, and you're going to listen to them because that's you're a kid. So uh, you are fighting that. But yeah, you have a. Can you clarify the correlation on the study that you did between like the worry or distress of the criminalization and the effect on the mental health? Like, does that make it better yeah. or worse? And maybe is there a correlation? Yeah, it's just pilot stuff. Um, but what I was trying to say is. I ask people how freaked out they are, essentially, by being federally criminalized. By, because these are medical marijuana patients, chronically ill, you know, who are getting cannabis under a doctor's or authorization under the state of Washington laws, but they're still criminalized in the eyes of the feds. So I said, how, much, how worried are you by that? It seemed like the more worried, if they said they were very worried by that, that they're actually, like, it, that was associated with an improved score on their standard psycho psychometric battery that I gave them, the 53 item questions about, hey, do you want to kill yourself? You know, do you hate yourself? Are you tired all the time? Are you upset all, you know, there's a series of, this is an old questionnaire that's been used for decades to assess kind of how mentally you know, stable you are, something like that. So it was this kind of, I was trying to see, I was also trying to tease out the idea of distress related to legal problems versus like true psychological, like mental health problems, you know, and that's the whole conflation that runs the, some of the drug, oh, you have legal problems, that must mean you're, you have a problem rather than the system is a problem. I also took the behavioral questions from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which asks about, you know, which the government does every year to ask how many people have substance abuse problems and ask them the cannabis questions and then said, would you answer this question differently if marijuana were treated like other herbal medicines? Because that takes out that effect of, oh, I spent a lot of time looking for marijuana. Oh, that means you have a drug problem. That you have spent a lot of time because there's only one legal supplier and I have to drive a far distance to get it. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to kind of tease out real distress from kind of so structural violence related distress. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and it, it, back to your question about messaging, I think, you know, it's really a matter of just what they've done, which is this education. You just have to educate and you just keep educating and, you know, eventually you'll, you'll, um, and people are already, you can get people on a telephone survey and randomly pick people from the phone book and ask them, do they support ending this laws and you'll get more than half people to say yes so that's that's we're already there you know it's you're in, it's not the inertia the momentum is in the right direction for for re re um, re uh, learning <laughs> messaging messaging is really important and uh, this is something you and I talked about when we brought up the uh, you know these cases that we're reading about in, in Colorado that you know that are whether it's children cookie looks good, might as well eat it, and then you put cannabinoid children are being admitted to emergency rooms, and then uh, college students jump out of the window, and we were discussing that in terms of, I think, I mean, the, the important point is, is sensing, sensitizing ourselves to how such um, uh, really horrible cases and sad, tragic situations are 
displayed and repackaged in the media so that people are led to believe that this is um, this is common, this is typical. Um, people who are an overdose on, on pharmaceutical substances never would have been talking about edibles, you know. And, and you know, we have we have to be aware of that in terms of how we talk to other people about such cases. And you know, of course, there's a need then to think about how things are labeled, the sort of information. That's right. Yeah, so, uh, it, it reminded me of the brain scan study that came out recently in the Journal of Neuroscience. There was this big study where they said, oh, small amounts of marijuana changes the brain. And, and this, I'm sorry, yeah, it was a 20 person study. This, this, the, in the press release put out by Northwestern University, the, the guy there, Hans something, his last name was the B, says, oh, this shows you that. You know, you don't want to be messing with those parts of your brain and this kind of thing. It was extremely blown up, but and the, the media just took that hook, line, and sinker. They just ran the press release. Okay, that sounds like the party line. And by the way, the fund, the study was funded in part by the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, the kind of prohibition arm. But other study, other money was there too, and uh, basically, you know, all these neuroscientists, researchers, and in, in our community was like, this is so unbelievable. This is actually, that's not saying that at all. Like there's a change in the brain, but you don't know if that's a negative or positive or what that is, if there really was anything there at all. It's a one point in time test. And you know, you're, all of their social factors associated with drug use, like stigma and criminalization, you could be just showing that. Oh, that's what happens when you do something that people don't, that's illegal in your community. That part of your brain changes. You know, it's, it's really like completely, uh, it's full of interpretation. And interestingly enough, the second, the lead author, who was a fellow at, at Massachusetts General, her, um, she says, oh yeah, I don't know, that was taken out of context, but the, by that time, the train had already left the station. That was run, run everywhere. And her fellowship is under the Norman Zinberg Fellowship at Harvard. He's the guy who wrote the book Drug Set and Setting, who basically, you know, established the importance of social context to understand drug use. That's what her money is under, that you know, the study was then misinterpreted and they forgot all about set and setting. So it's just an example, you're exactly right. Things get packaged in this particular way. We, we you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but that's what you, I mean, the edible issue is, uh, um, you know, being regulated now and people are, are, you know, need to think about ways to label and, and properly stow and then they need to have proper mitigation strategies for THC excess consumption. You need to know that there's other compounds you can take to mitigate those effects based on the traditional medical literature of limes and pistachios and um, pine oil is some traditional terpenes that that's what I've read I don't know I don't know and then CBD you know rescue uh, and not to mention just uh, pre uh, positive messaging about be wary of this if this happens here's what you need to do it'll pass I mean this is we're not talking it doesn't have to be come to a life and death situation it really doesn't it's a uh, there's a lot more going on there but um, we have to, yeah, get in front of that stuff. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for, oh, there's one more back there, okay. Cool. Do you know of any research that's been done possibly with children using cannabis or using substances for treatment? And since the same, you know, the rest of us that do, but in a way that we're researching their development as you know, how, how their brains develop is are they affected by this by these different substances in a negative way or is it right. is it a positive yeah most, there are studies longitudinal of children and cannabis exposure they're not as clean as you'd like them to be as far as like control and making sure this is actually effective cannabis or a hundred other variables you know that whole close study that you'd have if it was with a doctor in a, a monitored setting and you know, you just, we don't have that at all. We do know that, um, I mean, uh, I tell this to people all the time, they're worried about these THC and CBD only bills with children, for children across the country. They're saying, let's just have CBD cannabis. But the FDA has already allows the Marinol manufacturers, which is pure THC, they allow them to write on their drug label how to give that to children pediatric dosing because kids get brain and all kinds of cancers and they need that they use those THC pills and the manufacturer is allowed by the FDA to tell the doctor how to give it to children you know so uh, they didn't specifically study it on children but they were allowed to uh, move the results to children because they've been, it's been used in children for so long THC rich pills 
but um, you know whether there's like a, a long-term effect of that and there's again the social context matters you know if a kid is using something in the setting of criminalization and stigma and keep quiet about this because nobody needs wants to know about should know about this and your prince you'll get in trouble from your school and your authorities it's a different situation that has impacts on the brain you know chronic exposure to stigma and criminalization but a pure medical study you know that we don't have that but i can tell you that pharmaceutical cannabinoids are allowed to be used in children uh, and that um you know, um, I, I've seen a case of a child, who, this uh, Charlotte Fiji, she, she uh, you know, is now able to be verbal and speak and, and do social activities, whereas before she was not. So she had an improvement in her cognitive motor functioning after using a cannabis product. That's after just a year and a half. I don't know what's going to happen in the next, but it seems like things are moving in the right direction. But we haven't had that close study. There's been some studies on pregnant women who are using cannabis and whether that impacted like neonatal development. Again, those studies aren't very clean. It's not hard, it's hard to tease things apart. So I'm afraid that we don't have that kind of data um, as much as you'd like it, but we, it's, it's really a function of, of the illegality. That's why we don't have that. All right. Okay. Final word here, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a starting of us, cannabinergy.com. That's what been my personal website. We're, I've got a bunch of other websites where we're going to try to populate with information, scientific information about cannabis-related materials and have some good quality content from other people that I, I respect and trust so that people can, can kind of have some information there. It's uh, to be continued, just, but uh, stay, stay tuned on it. Yeah, no, the seed issue is a big pro, uh, big issue, and I think if people wanted to educate children about cannabis, they should talk about the whole plant and teach them about the uses of seeds and fiber, and not you know not just focus on the resin. It's like, well, I'm going to teach you about maple trees. Here's the sap. You know, you're not going to learn much about maple trees if you just focus on the sap of the maple tree. You, you, that's the best, I think, way as far as uh, education. There's been some great books for children in marijuana that you can look up. Okay, thanks a lot for your time.